It's the Orlando Opera. Central Florida's treasure for over 50 years. For more information on the Orlando Opera, follow the links at wmfe.org slash arts. Support for WMFE comes from the Orlando Museum of Art, presenting Stories of the New World, a custom art installation by renowned glass artist Thurman Statham, January 10th through May 10th. More information at omart.org. Made possible by... Franklin Templeton Investments. Gain from our perspective. I'm Paul Kangas with a nightly business report news brief. The Great Recession and rising unemployment are taking a toll on Social Security. Using figures from the President's budget and the Social Security actuary, it looks like this year's surplus could fall to $30 billion, down from the previous estimates of $83 billion. Wall Street staged an early rally on better-than-expected reports on February new home sales and durable goods orders, but a disappointing five-year Treasury auction muted the gains. The Dow closed up 89 points, Nasdaq rose 12, Standard & Poor's 500 up 7 points. Tomorrow, did Best Buy profit from the demise of rival Circuit City? We'll find out when it reports its quarterly results. For more financial news, tune in to Nightly Business Report weeknights on this public television station. There's a new place where you'll find the best entertainment for the whole family in Espanol. A place to learn, to explore. A place with talk shows, lifestyle, movies, and much more. Bienvenidos. Network with the best of public television and much more. Then. You're watching member-supported WMFE, serving Orlando, Daytona Beach, and Melbourne. This program was made possible by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. They were born to perform. My first break was when I went with Dr. Ari e. Lewis's medicine show. I was 10 years old. And we meet again, I'll say for now. Good luck, may God bless. I do remember being on the stage as a young kid. I was five, six years old, I guess. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to say what a tremendous thrill it is to be back once again. They learn their craft on the vaudeville stage. No, I started the vaudeville when I started, you know, back in 1928. But it's a great, great thrill to be back here once again, ladies and gentlemen, in New York. The entertainment is what it was. It was variety. It was uh, essentially singing, dancing, comedy. They polished their acts for decades. We had to pay our dues. We had to work all the joints, the lousy theaters. Oh, Milk, where do you get this material? <laughs> With the arrival of radio, is the star of our show, Red Skelton. They moved from the stage to the studio. I had my own radio show when I was five years old, Coast to Coast. Then came the cameras the bright lights, and the dawn of television. We had no money to copy, you know, there was nothing on, you know, except bowling and, and wrestling. Their destiny was to make this new medium entertaining for the masses. It was just great acts performing their best, and I meant great acts. They were vaudeville legends. Thank you very much. Radio superstars. George and Gracie. And television pioneers. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. There's no business like show business. You didn't f find a star on your door and stuff. God, I remember uh, they used to put stars on the door in chalk. And then after the first show, they'd go by with a sponge <laughs> and wipe it off. They are the pioneers of primetime.
1948, television was new, innovative, and desperate for programming. It needed to quickly capture America's interest. Network executives turned to established comedians. I says, I know as much about television as any of you guys do. We've all been in it for 20 minutes. And I said, I want to do it my way. I was asked by the agency that I was doing uh, the radio show for, uh, uh, could I think of an idea for a uh, television show? This is 48. And I said, oh, I got back to him. I said, the only thing that I can think of is what I've been doing in Vaudeville all my life in nightclubs, and that is to do a review. Introducing America's number one television star, who just returned from Washington after paying his income tax, Milton Berle! You may have children of your own one of these days. The small screen's first superstar called himself Uncle Milty, but he soon earned the nickname Mr. Television. I had a lot of comedians and stars come to me during 1948 and say, oh, why are you doing this? You don't need it. You're a big nightclub star. You're in Vegas and all that. I said, well, I want to try something new. Burl was the master of monologues, the sultan of slapstick, and the king of costumes. Thanks a million. Paul Milton, of course, is, uh, he is a genius. There's no question about it. And he can do anything. And he'll tell you that. I, you're, you're the one that's bigger than you. I'll smack you with right in the head. That's my joke. Where'd you get it? Did I get it? Hey, that was one. Where did he get it, see? Because it didn't. No. Milton Berle's Texaco Star Theater became the number one show on television and the premier guest spot for the biggest stars of the day. Me, I'm Burl. 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 Two Burl names. <laughs> now you listen to me. You broke the whole jaw. I Where broke the whole jaw. Because I'm Burl. He's the star. I'm the star. star. Now star. say you're sorry. Yeah, tell me you're sorry. I'm sorry you're a star. I, was I introduced. I was the master of ceremonies. All right, let go. You're bending the hanger. You're bending the hanger. I worked with all the acts. I don't like how well you two are working together. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I did all the shticks. I'll hit him. I'll bang him on the head. I'll kill my big fools with me. I don't like Tuesday nights at 8 o'clock, Uncle Milty owned the airwaves. Within weeks of the show's debut, hundreds of thousands of people who didn't own TVs went out and bought them. We all know the concept of must-see TV. Milton Berle was must-buy TV. There's a big difference, because Milton Berle was the one that you heard about and you wanted to go out to buy the television set. He sold television sets. Appointment Television was born as families gathered around their new TVs for a weekly dose of live entertainment. Those shows that I did in the early years, 1948, were all live. They were not on tape. I want to have soup. Oh, soup. 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 Go through the door. Go through the door. Now, live is a different animal altogether than what you have today. Now, I wonder if you tell our audience exactly who this lady is. I don't know who she is, but she's all right with me. That red light went on, that was it. And with no cue cards and no teleprompters. You had to know it. Everybody else had to know it. Sid Caesar's quirky genius brought a new twist to television. Mira, mira, Istanbul, who is the schlickest one of all? You're the schlickest man, get it right? 
You bet your sweet life. Yeah. With the debut of your show of shows in 1950. You did satires of books, you did satires of plays, you did satires of movies, you did satires of, 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 of life. As an actor, Caesar possessed incredible versatility, paired up with co-stars Carl Reiner, Howard Morris, and Imogene Coca, Caesar was sensational. Behind the scenes, the writing team was the finest ever assembled, featuring among others Mel Brooks, Larry Gelbart, Neil Simon, and Woody Allen. It starts with the writing, you know, it doesn't, you don't just step on the stage and go, well, I think I'll be funny. That ain't it. You have to sit down, you have to work, and the, and the writers, uh, you know, I was very fortunate I had the best writers there are. I mean, each one uh, started a school of his own. <laughs> Not long after Burl and Caesar conquered the viewers with slapstick and satire, a new art form arrived on TV. Yeah, will you ever forget the big game? <laughs> what a day. 40,000 people in the stands yelling, give us Speedy, put in Speedy, we want Speedy. <laughs> so they took you out and put in Speedy. <laughs> well, I the situation the comedy. The night before, I was up until 2 o'clock in the morning waiting for your folks to go to bed. So, so we could neck. <laughs> They should have put Speedy in then, too. <laughs> Television's first hit sitcoms are still the standard by which all others are measured. The Honeymooners and I Love Lucy. I Love Lucy debuted in 1951 and was an instant smash hit. Lucy's hilarious interplay with her co-star and real-life husband, Desi Arnaz, made the pair America's favorite comedy couple. How do you dare let a woman like that and have a figure like that come into this building? That's the biggest mistake. Hey, fella! Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> the show was not only groundbreaking in its superb writing and acting, but it was also the first sitcom to be filmed in front of a live audience for later broadcast. And ultimately, for syndication. It wasn't just one live show and, you know, try to remember it three days later. It, once it was put on film, and that, that really is the genius of Lucille Ball in what she was able to do. Lucille Ball, as funny as she was, Lucille Ball's contribution was as a brilliant, brilliant businesswoman. The syndication lesson was not lost on the honeymooners. The show is best remembered for its many years of reruns. The Honeymooners centered around the mundane life of a New York bus driver, played by a man who had been affectionately dubbed the Great One, Jackie Gleason. Like many other top-rated shows of the day, The Honeymooners featured few, if any, guest stars. As usual, I'm carrying the whole load on my shoulders. You're carrying the load, all right, but it's not on your shoulders. Gleason, Audrey Meadows, Art Carney, and Joyce Randolph, quite simply, the perfect ensemble. Gleason may have come close, but it was Red Skelton who brought definitive physical comedy to television. And now, the star of our show, Red Skelton! Skelton moved over to TV in the fall of 1951. He was a remarkable physical specimen. Consequently, he could do certain stunts that the average entertainer would not have been able to do. As a 
clown from pantomime to sight gags, well, here's to you. he had no equal. Skelton could carry a show all by himself, but also knew how to make good use of a willing co-star. That's the idea, that's the idea, that's the idea. And I have an idea. Uh, this is the address of my hotel. Oh, what a handy little briefcase. <laughs> oh, good heavens, that's still warm. Despite their immediate imprint on television, most of the giants of the small screen were not overnight sensations. One example is the great Jack Benny. He was 56 years old when he made his TV debut. In fact, many of television's first stars had arrived only after years of success and failure on radio and in a world called vaudeville. The reason that I think that I was successful in television was because of my vaudeville training. No, I started in vaudeville when I started, you know, back in 1928. And so I got used to an audience and uh, it's a, you need an audience. In fact, I have to put a applause machine in my bedroom before I can get up. Thank you very much. I just want to tell you, I'm very thrilled to be back here once again. Yeah, my mother was the charwoman at the Lemke Building, B.F. Keith's Vaudeville Theater in Indianapolis, Indiana. She got tickets for us four boys to go to the show. And uh, I watched all of them, but when the comedian came on, I watched the audience and I would look at him and then I look back at the audience again. And I said, that's what I want to do when I grow up. I want to try to make people laugh. I started when I was three years old. I, uh, I didn't do too much before then, just hung around the house, you know. I sang. I just sang. So people used to say, that's not a child, that's a 45-year-old midget. No child sings like that. And I went to each of these towns. I just went out and sang three or four songs. That was it. The term vaudeville was first used to describe a series of satirical songs in 15th century Europe. In early 20th century America, vaudeville became all the rage. These gladiators of entertainment crisscrossed the country, stopping wherever there was a theater and an audience. There were no movies. There was no radio. Uh, if you wanted to be entertained, you would either go to a circus or what they called vaudeville. The entertainment is what it was. It was variety. Most of vaudeville was a, was a conglomeration of uh, different types of acts, jugglers, uh, acrobats, everything. Nothing ever matched, and that's what made them so funny. Essentially, singing, dancing, comedy. It was the uh, ultimate family entertainment place, was vaudeville. And when you consider that every town had two and three theaters that had vaudeville, there was a lot of activity going around. Vaudeville was really a family affair, not just for the audience, but for the entertainers as well. My sister and I had a, a brother and sister dance act. And 
our second week in vaudeville, we played the Palace, which was the top theater in vaudeville at that time. I saw the O'Connor family with Donald O'Connor, and I saw him at the Orpheum Theater, and he was absolutely sensational. He was a young kid, and he was one of the world's greatest tap dancers, and he was an all-around entertainer. I would say he'd go down in history as one of the great entertainers. Well, I almost, I was almost born on stage. My mother was in the act, she was doing heavy stuff, acrobats and dancing and singing, what have you. I was born in St. Elizabeth Hospital in Chicago. And two days later, we were working some theater. So I went right on stage when I was three days old. I was, my mother played piano so she could get back doing the acrobats. So I was right next to her on the piano bench. Another star who grew up in his mother's shadow was Steve Allen son of Belle Montrose. My mother and father were a vaudeville comedy team. She played the part of a sort of an inexperienced performer who just stumbled on stage during the show by mistake and didn't know how to get off or how to do anything while she was there. She had a remarkable sort of low-key, ad-libby, muttered Irish wit. <laughs> Now, Belle Montrose was one of the funniest women I have ever seen. What is your vocation? What is that? I, oh, I'm a holy roller. No. No, that's not what... That is your belief. I mean your profession. For example, I am a great entertainer. That's your belief. I've seen them all. I've seen all the great comedians, and she used to make them roar. She was dynamite. The manager didn't want you to disappoint me. No, 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 Dis disappoint you. The manager didn't want you to disappoint you, so uh, he's gonna do it. No, no. Milton Berle, who worked with my mother on the same bill um, a few times when he was a teenager, has referred to her as the funniest woman in vaudeville, and I believe she was. And for the finish, uh, and for the finish, I'm through. That's all right. right. My mother was in the audience of every vaudeville theater I ever played in a seat, laughing it up. Now, now laugh, lady. Now you know what you look like when you get up in the morning. Please. You've got all night to make a fool of yourself. I only got an hour. Please. <laughs> Lady, please, don't laugh. Don't laugh. I'd like to see your baby pictures. She was always on, on front and a great laugher. And if the audience didn't laugh, she started <laughs> laughing. She had a very infectious laugh. My mother was my biggest rooter. Why? Love and pushing me on to try to reach the heights. Whether it was a family, comedy, or musical act, the vaudeville formula rarely changed. And for that matter, neither did the acts themselves. Some of these acts would go for 20 years and never change anything. But it didn't seem to matter. Performers didn't need new material as long as they could find new audiences. And they found them, packing theaters year after year. There were people that, that from all walks of life, they would come in and that's, and you've never seen a closeness like this. They weren't people sitting in a chair that would ignore the other people. They're all like a big family. Vaudeville, I think, had this uh, feeling of uh, producing a feeling of well-being and uh, friendliness among people. A lot 
are they actually treated as kings and queens, as royalty? You know, they didn't have a dime in their pocket, but this is where the audience treated these people, because they were special. Despite all the adulation, the life of a vaudevillian was far from easy. The hardest part of show business was vaudeville because you traveled from town to town and, and uh, did your shows and went on to the next town. You would finish your last show, let's say 11.30 at night, then you had to run back to the uh, dressing room and gather all your clothes and your musical arrangements from the orchestra leader, and uh, then you'd go to the uh, depot, the, the train station in town, maybe getting there at one in the morning, and your train didn't come along till 5.02. A few weeks of that would make you think, maybe I should get into some other business. We had to pay our dues. We had to work all the joints, the crap houses, the lousy theaters, till you got your act into a shape or form that you would be accepted to be put on another level. The big time came only to a select few after years of polishing one's act in small time vaudeville. Some of the people who were ultimately recognized as the giants of vaudeville, uh, Will Rogers, Fred Allen, uh, Burns and Allen, Milton Berle, people of that sort, they spent an awful lot of time bombing. You had places to break in your act, try out your material, and see if it worked. And you had places to flop in. You know, when you're getting, when you're getting laughs, that's what, what we're there for. If you're not getting laughs, it's pretty sad. But if your routine is playing, you bubble inside. Everybody does. It didn't hurt your act to engage in a little self-promotion. Every afternoon between shows, I would call every hotel because my name was in the ads in the paper and I'd have myself paged. <laughs> People said, Red Skelton, what the hell is that? Who's that? Red Skelton. The guy said, I don't know, I just saw his name in the paper here, you know? So I got publicity that way. And I got top billing. <laughs> the dedicated persevered, performing to the point of exhaustion. I can remember doing six and seven shows a day at the Chicago Theater in Chicago. People used to come in at 10 o'clock in the morning. There was nothing glamorous backstage at all. There were people pushing against each other in the darkness, trying to get off the stage, get on the stage. But suddenly you were on and then everything was glorious and glamorous and the lights were on you and the music was playing. It was a hard work, but we never, never thought of it that way. It was our, it was our life. In the teens and twenties, racism was entrenched in American society. The show business world was not much different. But there was one thing that set it apart. Well, the thing was talent. Actually, they didn't care whether you were blue, green, black, or white. They didn't care if you went to church or you didn't go to church. They didn't care what you thought, how much talent you got. But the stage was not the street. And while the stage may have been open to anyone with sufficient talent, the same did not necessarily apply to the dressing room, drinking fountain, hotel, or restaurant. Real equality was another matter altogether. It was into this unusual environment that Sammy Davis Jr. was born. Uh, this is the place. His father, Sammy Davis Sr., was a vaudeville star. As a young boy, Sammy Davis Jr. joined the act called Will Maston's Gang. It's no matter where we plant our feet on this great, big, beautiful earth. Why, there's nowhere that you can beat this place of our birth. Hey, we were different because we were show people. And the love that existed between each other you know, without racial barriers, without anything, man, it was there. But before our song is through, this is the place, thanks to you. When you stepped out of that protective world, that's when you were in trouble. So we had no desire to step in there. 
You stayed in the boarding house with show people. You stayed at the theatrical hotel. You ate in the theatrical restaurant. And these were your friends, these were your buddies. I think it's very easy when you see them entertaining to say that life is good, everyone's happy, everyone's fine, they're getting along. They look like this great team, well-oiled on stage. Again, I'd like for you to meet these two wonderful gentlemen who stand on either side. This is my dad, Sam Davis Sr., and my uncle, Will Maskin. It's not as simple as we all got along and it was fun and it was fine because once the entertainment was over, the reality of being black sets back in. So that, that uh, drama of, of blacks and whites working together in Vaudeville uh, was uh, a, a subset, so to speak, of the larger national drama of whites and blacks on the American continent, gradually and sometimes painfully, tragically, working out some sort of rational way to coexist. day vaudevillians, their time at the top didn't last long. By the late 1920s, vaudeville was dying. Huge movie theaters were being built in major cities. The small-time vaudeville theaters either dropped shows or simply closed altogether. Oh, the theaters to me were always like great temples. When they start tearing them down, it was like destroying a, a cathedral to me. And I felt always like royalty because I held court two times a day or four times a day with this, these people in front of me. In January of 1930, an obituary of sorts ran in the Saturday Evening Post. The story quoted a down-and-out producer who sobbed, Vaudeville ain't a business anymore. It's a disease. It hadn't reached its peak yet by any means. Uh, it would have gone on a lot lo longer if it hadn't been for radio and for movies. That's what really killed it. But all of those factors contributed to uh, the, the gradual diminishment of the glamour and the excitement and the importance of vaudeville. Every town had a vaudeville theater, but the circuits were gone. So you'd go from pillar to post to pillar to post. But man, between gigs was hard because there was no place to work. These people were so misplaced. There was nothing for them to do. And yet just yesterday, they had all of this adoration, this applause and the beauty of working on the stage and, and in front of an audience was all gone. All gone, totally lost. of vaudeville's demise, radio became the form of entertainment for the masses. And a handful of vaudeville headliners did make the transition from the stage to the studio. Yes, it's Maxwell House Coffee Time, starring George Burns and Gracie Allen. Fans who used to watch their favorite performers in theaters could now hear their idols at home. Now, let's see. Figuring our income on the basis of the community property law, that would make... What a, law, George? The community property law. That's the California law that says half of everything I've got is yours, <laughs> and half of everything you've got is mine. Oh? Then how come I only get one-fourth of the money we make? Well, that's the way it works out, dear. Look, I'll show you. Here in my hand is a dollar and change. Yeah. Now, half of everything I've got is yours. So here's 50 cents. Ah, oh, thank you. Now half of everything you've got is mine. How much have you got? 50 cents. Half of it is mine. Hand it over. <laughs> In the 1930s, 
Radio was it. It's what you did when you got up in the morning, when you came home in the afternoon, and what you did at night. You would sit around the radio and you would watch the radio. The, the great pictures of people sitting around, literally physically looking at the radio and hearing what was going on. Perhaps it was the skill of these performers in adapting time-tested acts to the new medium, or maybe the listener's ability to match a vaudevillian face with a voice emanating from a tiny speaker. These performers launched the golden age of radio. Young people today have no idea how big and, and prestigious and glamorous radio was, chiefly in the 1930s. In fact, many of the major comedians, the Burns and Allens, the Jack Bennys, the Fred Allens, people of that sort, really uh, achieved their major importance in radio. Bob Hope did, too. In 1932, veteran vaudevillians Ed Wynn, Fred Allen, along with George Burns and Gracie Allen, all made smooth transitions from the stage to radio. 1932 was also the year Jack Benny debuted on Ed Sullivan's radio show. Benny would become a radio institution, hosting his own program and making more than 900 broadcasts over 23 years. So without further ado, we bring you a very tiresome comedian. That's tired. And here he is, Jack Benny! For others, success in radio required a major transformation. In 1937, Red Skelton was forced to abandon his stage act of visual gags and pantomime for a new career behind the microphone. As I walked in, there were a lot of people outside, and, uh, and someone yelled, Red Skelton's in the crowd, and they all turned around and looked at me. <laughs> Gee, I was so embarrassed. <laughs> I was sorry I yelled. <laughs> drew on his skills as a master of ceremonies and creator of characters to launch a radio career that lasted 12 years. When I first went into radio, I'd get letters from mothers. We wouldn't let the children listen to the show because we thought Red Skelton was a mystery show. <laughs> so I had a form letter made. I sent it back. I said, it's not a mystery show. It just turns out that way. <laughs> no mystery as to why these stars of radio were so loved. Their cultural contribution to American society in the late 20s and early 30s was immense. With America in the depths of depression, the comedians of radio delivered laughter and hope to a needy nation. Americans turned to radio and they, and they wanted to be entertained. They wanted to get their mind off the dreariness of their days. And so the laughter that was brought by these great comedians, Bob Hope and, and, and Jack Benny and, and Red Skelton and Amos and Andy, these were important people that were coming into their homes. They felt comfortable with these people. These people made them laugh. Were you expecting them? No, but then my mother wasn't expecting me either, but here I am. <laughs> And because of that connection that took place at that time, that was a deep-seated connection with the American people. I reckon as how I got a hankering to visit the old corral. <laughs> and they stayed with those comedians during the 30s and during the 40s. And they grew up with them. And their children grew up with them. They were part of the family. And here he is, Jack Benny! When television came along with the 50s, they just followed them into the new media. Like sound coming to the movies, it was only a matter of time before pictures would come to radio. Within two decades of taking the entertainment throne from vaudeville, radio's reign was over. Television, a familiar group of performers Milton, Bob Hope. would lay the foundation on which this new kingdom would rise and prosper. Red 
it was a very natural thing in the early days of television to just go back to the vaudeville form. We'll try to make show business room right inside your living room. When I went on television in 1948, made my debut on television with the Texaco Star Theater, I recall very, very well that it was a form and a format of my vaudeville days. And we had what we called a review. <laughs> where there was no sitcom, there was no storyline. It was just great acts performing their best. And I'm in great acts. Come over here. What are you idea hitting this fella? Go up and apologize. Shake his hand. Oh, no, he was... Shake his hand. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Burl's NBC show was so successful that within weeks, CBS debuted its own variety show. Ed Sullivan became television's consummate master of ceremonies by using the proven performers and format of vaudeville for 23 seasons. Welcome to the Ed Sullivan show. Yeah, don't rub it in. Television became vaudeville with the Ed Sullivan show. To Ed, it really didn't almost matter who, who was on. He would just get five or six good acts and cram him into his hour. And uh, it was nevertheless always a good show because vaudeville itself was good entertainment. Television was now a beloved form of American entertainment, and its roots were obvious. The Comedy Hour, starring Bob Pope. Television's biggest act for hire was Bob Hope. Do I look like I'm gonna fall over? I am, believe me. Thank you very much. I just want to tell you, I'm very thrilled to be back here once again for Frigid Air, to grab a little of that quick frozen money. I, uh, I Hope masterfully great, great adapted his vaudeville and radio money. skills to television. <laughs> I want to say it's a great, great thrill to get back on television. I've, uh, uh, this is my third, I've had three shots on television. Fortunately, they all miss me, but I must say. It's uh, just a matter of picking the right material and uh, knowing what the audience will go for. Uh, would you believe he's buying me a brand new television set? <laughs> A new one? Uh, with a 10-inch screen. Oh, my goodness. It, it'll be like being there in person. <laughs> Please don't it didn't me. seem to matter what variety show or what network Hope called home for the night. He always left him laughing. You give me Bob Hope any time. You really like him? Oh, that I don't understand. I mean, I could if you had a son in the service. <laughs> George Burns and Gracie Allen had successfully turned their vaudeville act into an 18-year run on radio. The couple's move to television in 1950 was just as successful. But the minute I got in the doctor's office, I knew he was no good. You knew he was a bad doctor? Yeah, all his patients were sick. <laughs> Burns had perfected his role as the long-suffering husband and straight man to his scatterbrained wife. Uh, he had a beautiful blonde nurse, and even she was sick. She was sick, yeah, too? Yeah, she kept begging him to take out her appendix. The nurse wanted her appendix taken out? Yeah, every time she went into his private office, I could hear her saying, Now, doctor, please cut it out. Gracie, meanwhile, was the classic dimwit. Brilliant and utterly convincing in the role. It's safe to say most of her audience never realized that off-camera Gracie Allen was the exact opposite of her character. From Television City in Hollywood, we bring you the Jack Benny Show. Jack Benny made a gradual entry into television. Benny's ongoing character, the violin-playing cheapskate, was familiar to radio listeners. <laughs> But his TV show was unpredictable.
From week to week, the show switched formats from situation comedy to single sketch to straight variety. But one thing remained constant, Jack Benny's impeccable comedic timing. Jack Benny, you know, he played the role of a, of a Hollywood star. I mean, that was the role he played. He played himself. I just spent the most wonderful half hour I've ever spent in my life. I was listening to my own radio show. <laughs> and I don't know, I, I don't know, I was so comical, you know. <laughs> I said so many funny things. <laughs> His program became one of TV's highest rated and stayed that way for 14 seasons. Thank you, thank you very, very much, ladies and gentlemen. Red Skelton had packed away his bag of physical comedy tricks and sight gags when he left vaudeville for radio. His radio success was built on a host of colorful characters that emerged from his fertile imagination. Right, and out came this one turkey. <laughs> In 1951, Skelton unleashed a comic arsenal that exploded onto the small screen. How come when I walk, I'm people toe? <laughs> well, because all of my jokes that I did in radio were visual. Like Junior, what are you doing? Are you pulling that cat's tail? No, I'm not pulling the cat's tail. I hold it on. He's doing the pulling. Well, it's a joke that you could see. So all I did when I went on television was to act them out. Boy, look at that, dude. You know what holds that up? A city ordinance. <laughs> his fondness for ad-libbing and cracking up his guest stars gave studio writers fits. Too much trouble. Would you rub this suntan oil in my back? Hmm? Well, this ought to lead to comedy. <laughs> Nonetheless, Skelton's show ranked among television's top 20, an incredible 15 years in a row. Good heavens, what's that thing? A mole? It's moving. Oh, <laughs> hey, would you like some on your clavicle? I guess it's all right, they left it in. The writers hated me. I never met the writers. If I had listened to writers and did what they gave me, I wouldn't have been on uh, two years, you know. Now we come to eating the corn. Now first you have a girl who's very shy eating corn. She doesn't want to know, uh, let anyone know that's the first time she's been out. <laughs> Why didn't you cook it? But I was on 20 years consecutive. That's pretty good, I guess. May we thank you for allowing us to be a part of your evening. So until next week, we say good night for now, and may God bless. Good night. <laughs> Overall, Vaudeville's approach and television's format worked well together. But there was one big difference. Unlike vaudeville, where the same act thrived for years with few changes, television demanded fresh material every week. The singer or a comedian had a chance because they had people supplying material constantly, new material. It could go on for years. Well, you got one act, 10 million, 20 million, 40 million, 100 million people see a night. That act, you can't do it again. So no, no one prepared for it. As George Burns used to say, um, there'll be no more development of good vaudeville acts because, and I quote, there's no place left to be lousy anymore. Lousy is something early TV was not likely to tolerate. The networks tried to weed out the bombs that regularly fell on vaudeville stages. Then as now, the bottom line was high ratings. As a consequence, there were a lot of short careers among early TV entertainers. A perfect example is Ed Wynn, a giant of vaudeville and radio, 
Wynn hosted one of the first TV shows based in Los Angeles. I thought you had a television show. Yes, yes, I've been on television for three months now. <laughs> That's why I started to wait today. A guy's got to eat, you know. <laughs> The Ed Wynn Show won the first Emmy for Best Live TV Show in 1949. But that was it. In less than two years, The Ed Wynn Show was history. You know, it went like that. Lud. TV's insatiable appetite for new material would eventually take its toll on even some of the biggest stars. Take, for example, the Colgate Comedy Hour. This is the 98th Colgate Comedy Hour, starring Donald O'Connor. The only time you should stay at home is to watch television, because when you're out on your own... A variety show with a revolving set of famous hosts, like Donald O'Connor. It's a wonderful, wonderful feeling when you bump into someone you know. This star-studded show competed successfully against Ed Sullivan, but not for long. It lasted just five seasons. It's surprising to many that Jackie Gleason's highly acclaimed Honeymooners also lasted only five years. Even the young cast of Sid Caesar's Your Show of Shows succumbed to the creative demands of television after just four glorious seasons. Nobody hits a thousand. Nobody hits a thousand. You have to expect failure. Not everything is going to work. And that's the way it is through life. Comedy is life. It has ups and it has downs. That's it. Reaching the top of any profession is difficult. To stand at the apex of three distinct genres of entertainment is flat out mind boggling. And to stay on top is nothing short of Herculean. Such are the accomplishments of Red Skelton, Jack Benny, Bob Hope, Milton Berle, George Burns, and Gracie Allen, masters of vaudeville, radio, and television. I think people who were able to, to build on their tremendous success in vaudeville move into radio at its infancy, stay vital and important during the, the run, the heyday of network radio, and to be around and still be fresh and vibrant at the dawning of a new medium called television. That is a combination of being in the right place at the right time, but also having the basic talent that your talent works in different venues. The role of a pioneer is to break new ground, blaze a new trail, open a new frontier for others to take advantage of. But the pioneers of prime time were tough acts to follow. I definitely think they were more talented. I mean, I, I, think, I think today, you know, comedians tell jokes and singers sing and dancers dance and, uh, and, and, and they're isolated. Everyone has become a specialist, even in the field of, of show business. We're the last of a breed, man. Because we had to learn how to sing, dance, play the drums, act. Because no matter what happened, you didn't know which one would be called on for you to do. There is a handful of people, the Bennies, the Hopes, the Burls, the Red Skeltons, there's a handful of people that had that immense innate talent. They were able to do it all. And they took it from the beginning, the basic training of their careers, through the battles of radio, to the battles of television. And in doing so, they made themselves indelible in our minds. And we laughed all the way. It's often said change is the only constant. In entertainment, 
as in life. But one thing hasn't changed. We still love to be entertained. Entertainment is always going to be there. There are no rules of comedy. Whatever people laugh at, that's it. The laughter produced at the dawn of television still resonates. You know there's nothing like laughs anyway. That's, that's the happy side of life. It was born of a magical convergence of timing, technology, and talent. If you have any talent, it's a God's gift to you. And if you use that talent, that's your gift to God. Laughter, created by a collective group of legendary performers, the likes of which we will never see again. It's sad that that just isn't anymore. It's gone with the wind. It was an enriching, rewarding, very memorable, and uh, looking back, a uh, loving experience. The thing was to get out there and work in front of an audience, hear this applause, this laughter, to work to the music, and to be in this kind of life. It's not always fun in show business, but if you have real talent, there's just something that pushes you along, and uh, that's lucky for the rest of us, isn't it? And I think everyone that's on this show has that same feeling. Because it's a lot of blood, sweat, tears, and cheers, and you gotta go through it all. But if you're dedicated, you'll work it out. It'll be worked out. They wrote the rules of television. They invented a whole new form of entertainment. They dramatically changed our world. They are the pioneers of primetime. So until we meet again, I'll say goodbye for now and may God bless. To order Pioneers of Primetime on video cassette or DVD, call 1 800 Play PBS. He says, since I saw you folks, he says, since I saw you folks last, he says, I got married. Got married. I can't tell you how old I was, but I was going with Betsy Ross. You know, you want to add some humor in this? Do you? My wife's brother introduced this. He says to me, would you like to meet one of my sisters? I said, you've got sisters? He says, I've got two. One's named Hortense and the other's named Lassie. I said, Lassie's a dog. He says, so is, wait, you see Hortense. <laughs> I don't know where I've been or what I've done, but I wouldn't have missed it for the world. <laughs> Oh my goodness, I, I miss Gilligan's Island. Anyway. This program was made possible by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. We are PBS. Stay tuned for more quality programming. Coming up next on member-supported WMFE. Next time on Pioneers of Television. We got something going here, haven't we? Boy, I hit the bullseye right in the face. <laughs> Say, are most stolen cars recovered? I had one recovered in zebra once. <laughs> okay, tomorrow we make another phone call, so be sure and get your cards in. Win or lose, they had the time of their life. on Pioneers of Television. We knew the battle was gonna come. I figured I could make a stand here. We are united in one common cause. He had a vision. These lands are ours. Here we shall remain. Five epic stories of courage and resilience. We shall remain. Coming soon to WMFE. Spark your curiosity, stimulate your imagination, 
Join WMFB and Lanuba by Cirque du Soleil for an evening that transforms the ordinary into the extraordinary. For more information, call or visit WMFB.org. Support for WMFE comes from the Orlando Museum of Art, presenting Stories of the New World, a custom art installation by renowned glass artist Thurman Statham, January 10th through May 10th. More information at omart.org. Ed Matt grew up during the Depression. We were poor, but we didn't neglect the things that are important. I was fortunate enough to have givers in my community. So today, I support the things in which I believe. One such thing is public television. Ed included his public television station in his will. Consider joining the community of people who want public television to span generations. El Devo are back. They're refreshed, reinvigorated, and ready to show Central Florida just what we've been missing. El Devo, the original and most popular operatic quartet, are bringing their virtuoso blending of operatic technique with romantic and popular song to the Amway Arena on Saturday, June 27th at 7.30 p.m. For tickets and information, call 1-866-955-9633 or visit WMFE.org. Save your Saturday for comedy, for grooving, for rhythm. Save your Saturday for laughter. The Saturday Night Brit Comps, where the fun is just beginning, right here on WMFE. We have a bouncy champagne time. <laughs> You're watching member-supported WMFE, serving Orlando, Daytona Beach, and Melbourne. Good evening from Los Angeles. I'm Tavis Smiley. Tonight we look at the life and legacy of historian John Hope Franklin, who passed away this morning at the age of 94. The Oklahoma native graduated from Fisk University and went on to become the first student from an all-black college to be accepted at Harvard. In 1982, Franklin joined the faculty at Duke, where he would establish his legacy as one of the nation's preeminent historians. In 1995, he was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Back in 2006, John Hope Franklin joined us here in the studio for an extensive conversation following the release of his remarkable memoir, Mirror to America. Tonight, some thoughts about his lasting legacy and to look back at that very special conversation. We're glad you've joined us. Our tribute to the late, great John Hope Franklin coming up right now. Nationwide Insurance proudly supports Tavis Smiley. Tavis and Nationwide Insurance, working to improve financial literacy and the economic empowerment that comes with it. Nationwide is on your side. And by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. John O. Franklin was born in a small, all-black town in eastern Oklahoma back in 1915. It's hard to imagine the extraordinary American life that lay ahead of him. Through hard work and an unyielding sense of optimism, John O. Franklin made his way out of the segregated South, eventually to Harvard, and then to Brooklyn College as the first African American in the U.S. to lead a university history department. In 1954, he was part of the team of scholars that helped Thurgood Marshall in the landmark case of Brown versus Board of Education. Franklin also penned of course, one of the seminal texts on race in America called From Slavery to Freedom. As I mentioned at the top, John Hope Franklin was awarded the nation's highest civilian honor back in 1995. At the ceremony, President Bill Clinton called Franklin a moral compass for America, always pointing us in the direction of truth. Back in 2006, John Hope Franklin paid us a visit following the release of his acclaimed autobiography. I began our conversation then by asking him about the meaning of the title, Mirror to America. When you title a book Mirror to America, you know there are a thousand ways I can go with this. Uh -huh. So the first thing that hits my mind when, I, when, when the book came across my desk was to ask you, Mirror to America, when you step to the mirror, when I step to the mirror on any given morning, any given day, 
The minute I look in the mirror, there are certain things I see.